Um, hello, everyone. My name is Christy Daly. I teach government here at Oakwood College. And um, to get started, let's uh, talk about what the panel is discussing today. <coughs> While the Seneca Falls Convention met in 1848 and the 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920, in the decades in between, most of the greatest successes for the suffrage movement occurred in Western states. This panel will discuss the question of why this occurred by examining specific Western states and their relationship to the early women's rights movement in the United States. So, our panel here is composed of, we'll start over here on the left, we have uh, Cheryl Boswell, who's got an MA. She's an adjunct instructor of government and history here at Weatherford College. Um, and Tarrant County College. We have Derek Everett, who is an assistant professor of history at Colorado State University and senior lecturer at Metropolitan State University of Denver. We have James Fink, who has a PhD, associate professor of history at University of Science and Arts of Oklahoma. Jason Pierce, which is... That's <laughs> <laughs> up. PhD, <laughs> Associate Professor of History and Department Chair at Angela State University. Um, so, without further ado, we will get started with presenter Cheryl Fossil. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Christy. Good afternoon, everyone. I will be examining Texas. So, the women's suffrage movement in Texas uh, really doesn't start taking off until the end of Reconstruction, which is going to be 1876. And it waxed and waned throughout, you know, our state's history up until the 19th Amendment does get passed. There's going to be some resolutions at two different conventions in 1868 and again in 1875 that were presented to try and get women's suffrage passed, but unfortunately they do fail and we're going to look at those. So, um, Without further ado, let's get started. So one of the driving arguments for why they wanted to enfranchise women is that women are citizens and they are taxpayers. They should be entitled to having a voice in government. Sound reason, sound logic, right? But there were a lot of opponents of women's suffrage that said that status quo should remain in place. Let's not disrupt, you know, or rock the boat. But government was deemed to just be the purview of men and it's beyond the scope of women or it's just a little too difficult for them to understand, right? So there was this daunting task of trying to change public opinion, and that was their biggest obstacle. So at the 1868 to 69 convention, and again at the 1875 convention, which these were years that the state of Texas met and rechanged and modified their state constitution. Texas, if you've ever taken Texas government, you know there's a lot of different constitutions in our state's <laughs> history. The most recent that we still have is left over from the 1875 convention that year. And so at the first convention in 1868 to 69, Titus Mundine of Burleson County, he proposed that the franchise or voting rights be given to qualified people without distinction of sex. And there was gonna be a committee on state affairs that met to try and approve the proposal, but it was ultimately rejected by a vote of 52 to 13. And prior to that, there was a woman, a suffragist named Martha Goodwin Tunstall, that she addressed a group of women's suffrage supporters in Austin advocating and educating people on why women do need to be given the right to vote. And the national suffrage leaders Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, they heard news of this advocacy and listed her to be the vice president of NASA representing Texas. And two resolutions were then presented at the 1875 convention a few years later. And both were referred to the committee on suffrage, but neither was reported at a committee. And this is a practice we call pigeonholing when you look at Texas government. Something gets referred to committee and it just never gets considered. It just gets shut in the dark and put aside and never gets considered. So throughout the 1880s and 90s after this happened, Texas suffrage for women was mainly just a grassroots movement and it was gonna take some time to really get all the war running. So during this time, a lot of the women's suffrage was tied with the Women's Christian Temperance Union, with the temperance movement to try and ban the Salem manufacture of alcohol if you know any history about the temperance movement, right? And the uh, 
WCTU president, uh, Mary Viana Thompson Folsom, she was the president of the WCTU Women's Christian Temperance Union here in Texas, and the NASA vice president, Jenny Blanbosham, they organized together to travel all across the state advocating for suffrage. They really wanted to get that grassroots public opinion on board with their cause because they knew if they got enough public support, eventually they'd be calling on you know their representatives, their senators, and could eventually get that statewide <coughs> suffrage passed. But uh, <coughs> finally, Texas was going to establish the Texas Equal Rights Association in Dallas in May of 1893 in the TERA. They would have the auxiliaries in several different cities, so you see it's still kind of a grassroots effort. It's going to take some time. And they had a bit of a decline, but finally, there will be three women, the Finnegan sisters, that they got together and formed the Equal Suffrage League of Houston in February of 1903. And this is when we start to see things really starting to move forward with the suffrage movement in Texas. So there was going to be a similar organization that followed in just a few years that would get set up in Galveston by good old Minnie Fisher Cunningham, who was one of the most prominent Texas suffragists, and she's going to be really vital in the effort to get the right to go passed in 1918 that we're going to talk about soon. But uh, Jess Baker of Granbury, he was the representative that maintained contact with most of the women's suffragists to try and see about getting something introduced at the legislative session. And finally, he introduced a joint resolution in the Texas House of Representatives for women's enfranchisement in 1907. It again would be pigeonholed in committee. They ultimately decided not to adopt it. In 1908, they're forming another women's suffrage club. So it's like they're li not letting any of these obstacles stand in their way. So like, we're not dying out, we're not giving up. Yep. So during the time, NASA, the Na National American Women's Suffrage Association, they still continue to organize a plan for continuing the suffrage organizing here in Texas. So six more states and territories during this time and the U.S. would enact full suffrage for women, and Texas suffragists were like, we need to still do this. Our efforts are not going to die in vain. So their continued support with Jess Baker of Granbury, and they found another ally with T.H. McGregor of Austin. Both of them introduced resolutions to the Texas House in 1911 and 1913. Both of them got referred to the Constitutional Amendments Committees, and they still died. But more than 100 people from seven cities in Texas were going to finally convene in San Antonio in April of 1913 to revive that Texas Women's Suffrage Association. And Annette Finnegan, she had left the state, left the organization, traveled to New York. She then came back to Texas to succeed as the president of this association. And in 1915, that legislative session saw a lot of opposition to women's suffrage during the time. And both advocates and opponents were actively organizing to try and get their efforts passed or not. But this was going to be the closest that we had to getting it passed until it finally did. There were 90 votes in favor of it and 32 against, but still wasn't that two-thirds majority that they needed. So, but they're like, we're not going to die out yet. We're not done yet. You know, we, we're this close. We can't let it die yet. So finally, uh, Miss Finnegan, Annette Finnegan, she looks to the president of the Galveston Equal Suffrage Association, Minnie Fisher Cunningham, that I mentioned. She is going to name her as her successor of the Texas Women's Suffrage Association, and Cunningham is going to rename the association with full support as the Texas Equal Suffrage Association. Why should it just be for women? You know, we need to advocate this for African Americans too, who we're also being disenfranchised during this time period. But there was another obstacle. Governor Jim Perso. Mm -hmm. Governor Jim Perso. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Governor Jim Paul Ferguson. He was the biggest, most vocal <coughs> opponent of women's suffrage during this time period. But what's good for the women's suffrage movement in Texas at this time, not so good for him, is he gets involved in some scandals and the suffragists, they're like, all right, let's get him out. <laughs> Let's get him out. They organized the grassroots effort to get him impeached. And to this day, he is still the only governor that has been impeached and removed from office. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, don't mess, with don't mess with Texas women, right? They will get it done. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> 
Why did he leave? What was his name? What was his name? Yeah. Jim Ferguson. James Ferguson. <coughs> but uh, succeeding him was going to be the Lieutenant Governor William P. Hobby. And he was a very big supporter of women's suffrage. And so they finally found their advocate in government. And with him being so supportive, and you think Ferguson was <coughs> out of the picture? No. <laughs> no, he decided he's going to try and run for office again, even though by law he's not supposed to. But the suffragists said, well, if you guys support us in getting an amendment passed, or a law passed for allowing women's suffrage, we'll get our supporters to make sure he doesn't get the support he needs. We'll throw our support behind William Hobby, get him reelected, and it works. So finally, at the 1917 legislative session, they get a law passed. And so finally, women in Texas are able to vote in primary elections starting in 1918. <coughs> so this doesn't mean they can vote you know, for president or in the general elections for their state representatives and senators, but they can at least have a say in who the candidates for the party are going to be. So that's going to be the big success for women in Texas. It does take place before the 19th Amendment, but it's still not enough. They try to get a state constitutional amendment passed with the 1919 uh, legislative session, they're unsuccessful, but then lucky for them, the 19th Amendment gets passed the next year, right? So that is the history of the Texas suffrage movement. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Jim Ferguson, he was impeached and removed. He tries to run for governor again in 1916. And the women's suffrage movement, they were very vital in getting Hobby, William Hobby, elected to office that year. And so he rewarded them with getting the support for them with the 1918 law. So I have a question. Yes. Teaching government as well. One of the things that I visit with my students about is the fact that in our U.S. Congress, we only have, even though women make up more than 50% of the country, we only have less than a quarter representation in Congress. Mm -hmm. So I'm always asking my students, do you think, you know, laws would be different or the country would be different if it was, you know, 50-50? And I get a lot of different responses, but the thing that always strikes me is when women got the right to vote, do you think things in the country changed? And if so, sort of how? That's an interesting question. Thank you. That is a very interesting <laughs> question. Thank you. Um, they did change in both good and bad yeah. ways. You know, during this time, after women get the right to vote, this is the height of the progressive era, where there's a lot of reform going on. So it kind of happens at just the perfect time yeah. for women getting the right to vote. And so then would you go on to say that if women made up 50% of Congress, legislation today might look different than it does? I think it might, yeah. Some people claim to be like, well, women tend to be more even-tempered. They're not as prone to violence. Well, look at Lisa, Lizzie Borden, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, that's, you know, that common stereotype, you know, but that's not always the case, right? You get them on both sides of the fence, right? But I think laws might be different if women had a more significant say with having that 50 by different, you mean better. Questions? Let me throw in something real quick. Sure. The getting to vote in the primary is actually really significant in Texas because Texas is effectively a one party state mm -hmm. in the time. And where, you know, Texas is a Democratic state, right? So if you get to vote in the primary, that the Democrat is going to win the general election most of the time, right? And it was another, we're back in segregation, right? One of the ways Texas kept African Americans from voting was having what they called the white primary. Yes. Where you had to be white to vote, 
well, and then you couldn't vote for the Democrat, so the Democrats going to win, right? So uh, having uh, women actually get to vote in the primary may not sound like much, but it's actually a really yeah. big deal. It was a huge deal, and with the uh, the state constitutional amendment that was proposed with the 1919 legislative session, uh, women really, really wanted to vote because they could vote in primaries, not the general election. Their voice got left out. Okay, let's see. So, uh, Texas were a Democratic state up until 1980 when uh, Ronald Reagan went to office and was a Republican president. But up until that point, Texas was a Democratic state. Yes, well, De Texas, before the Civil War, had been Democratic, and then after the Civil War, had been Democratic. Uh, and you'll start to see the parties, uh, you know, you probably yeah, jump on this uh, as, uh, more than here. You'll start to see the parties kind of realign, uh, really beginning in the 1960s. In other words, the things that people are supporting and what those parties represent <coughs> just to change. Right. Do we have any other questions before we move on? Okay, for the I'll answer one of them that you asked, just because I think it's an interesting question. You know, when women were in 1920 and women in now, I think still one of the differences that we, we don't think about with the 1920s women is a, a large majority of those women were still looking at sort of separate sphere ideology. You know, they wanted to vote to do jobs of women. Let's stop alcohol, let's look at the moral issues. Um, and there was always, the, you know, I said there's the two real groups in the 1920s. You have your Carrie Chapman Cat, which is kind of doing conservative, right? We need to do, we want the vote to do our job as women. And then you had your Alice Paul, which was a much more smaller group, and they were the ones that are saying, you know, quality, quality, quality. Yeah. So one of the reasons why I think when women get the right to vote in 1919, 1920, the women's right movement kind of fizzles and dies, and we don't see it again until really the 1960s in, in a large movement, because for a lot of women, it wasn't about equality as much as it was about doing our job as women. And so when they got those votes in 1920, a lot of those women were looking at those domestic issues, where I would say today, when women are getting the right to vote, it's, it's the same as what any man is looking for in a lot of ways, where the 1920s women voting is, we don't always think of it this way, but they really were looking at something different. And not that there wasn't women that were left for equality, but they were really a small minority of the population. Most women wanted to do women's job, yeah, and they can't do it unless they vote. Yeah, that's fine. Um, okay, well let's get the next... Just a quick question. Sure. He mentioned Alice Paul in Texas women. Was there any Texas prominent Texas women involved in the militant side of, of the suffrage unit? You know, the chaining ourselves to the, and we're going to starve. And Not so much. Like when I was doing the research and looking through the records for it, most women in Texas, they would organize like rallies mm -hmm. and have some parades and marches, things like that. But they weren't, you know, let's chain ourselves to, you know, the capital. Fence, you know, yeah. and be like, votes for women. You know, I'm sure some of them were arrested for protesting. You know, when you hear about you know, blocking the, the street, yes, the hunger strikes, <laughs> and you know, they were forced to in prisons and things like that. You know, that's not to say that didn't happen. It's just it wasn't as common mm -hmm. in Texas as it was like mm -hmm. on the national stage. Cool. So, good. Okay, and if we're not mistaken, next up then we have. Do, 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 do. Derek Everett. And actually, I'm going to let Dr. Pierce go first, because his story kind of leads into mine. Okay, okay. So Jason Pierce, yeah. would you like to come on up? Uh, sure. You come, come on down. down. <laughs> yeah. One dollar. Uh, <laughs> Rosie, Rosie. Yeah. Uh, Jason Pierce, would you like to come on up? Uh, I'm actually um, talking about Wyoming. Um, Wyoming is uh, kind of interesting. We always, maybe if you know anything about this, Wyoming is the very first place, apparently in the entire Western world, that lets women vote. They do that in 1869. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, one of the slogans for Wyoming is the equality state. Which probably <laughs> looks good, probably on a license plate or something. I don't know. But so, the, the, and I in fact taught it this way, uh, I, you know, that, that Wyoming is the first state to do this because there's very few women in Wyoming and the women that are there are doing the jobs of men and, you know, out there, you know, uh, you know roping horses and, you know, and doing all these, you know, manly things. And the guys in, uh, in Wyoming were like, well, those women have earned their, you know, chance to, uh, to vote. Right? 
But it, and that's kind of how the, the myth of why Wyoming was the first state to let women vote is kind of, that's where it stays. But it turns out that that's only like a tiny bit of the story. Um, and one of the things I think we're going to talk about is the, the western states that let women vote all do it for their own reasons and their own um, kind of local issues. Uh, when uh, Dr. King talks about Utah, he's going to talk about the issues going on in, in Utah. And in Wyoming, you know, uh, the same thing. So in Wyoming, there was a guy, I'll put his name on the board, uh, named uh, William Bright. Easy to remember because he's a bright guy. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, dad jokes. I, I said one the other day that was so bad, even my son, I got a matcha green tea at Starbucks, and I said, you know what, I'm a matcha matcha man. That was my son's reaction, too. Uh, yeah, that was a better reaction. That's better than uh, that. Thank you, sir. As, as a comedian, please don't use it. Uh, it's not a good one, I have been. Um, so anyway, so this guy, William Bright, um, he was from Virginia. Uh, during the Civil War, though, he was one of those Virginia guys that decided to fight with the Union. When they keep the, you know, fight for the Union and keep the country together and all that kind of stuff. Well. Um, he rose through the ranks of the Union Army, eventually ends up, uh, at the end of the war, a colonel. Uh, but after the war, uh, he's looking to, you know, kind of make his way in the world. And so, even though Horace really hasn't said it this yet, he thinks, I'm going to go west, uh, young man. He's not that young, he's late 30s at this point. But go out west and try to kind of, you know, find, uh, you know, his fame and fortune out there. Also, he decides to marry a woman about 15 years younger than him, and they head out for Utah. Uh, after a little while in Utah, around Salt Lake, uh, rumor, uh, there's rumors that there are gold strikes in, in South Pass, Wyoming, kind of near the old Oregon Trail. So he packs off with about 15 or 20 guys, heads off for the South Pass, and uh, eventually starts getting a bunch of mining claims. There's not that much gold. They start selling all these claims to suckers, uh, and he's <laughs> making a little bit of money that way. Uh, and then eventually he brings his wife now with his newborn son that was delivered while he was, she was in Utah, he was in Maui. So he, he meets his son for the first time. And anyway, long story short, he kind of goes into business and so on. Well, he becomes prominent enough by opening the saloon so that he knows everybody because they come to the saloon that he decides to run for the territorial legislature. Uh, and, and I'll put that up there too. Uh, Wyoming is not a state yet. It's a territory. And there are some weird rules about what a territory is and how a territory works. So when you're, uh, and you maybe have run across this in you know, History 1301 or something like that, but basically what happens is uh, all these territory places, they don't get to run their own affairs. So when they're first set up, the President of the United States picks somebody to be their governor. And then that goes for a while until enough people start moving there, I think it's 6,000, and then they can form a territorial legislature. The governor is still appointed by the president, but the, you can now vote for your, uh, at least your local representative. So anyway, so William Bright decides to run for uh, his territorial legislature as the representative of South Pass. Since he uh, owns the, the local liquor establishment, everybody knows him, they're like, that Bright guy is pretty nice, and they vote for him. So he gets to be their local representative. Now some people think that his wife, uh, Linda is her name, uh, is kind of working on him to support women's suffrage. Uh, we don't know if that's exactly the case, but it's, it seems pretty likely. So anyway, when he gets to the legislature, he supports this women's suffrage bill. And he works to get the <coughs> other members of the, of the territorial legislature to support it. It's not that many people. It's 22 people. That's the entire territorial legislature. We would be the government of Wyoming in this classroom, right? Uh, in fact, we're bigger than it. Yeah. Still to this day. No, not quite. Uh, it's grown a little bit. Uh, so, anyway, so, uh, so he uh, kind of channels support and is able to uh, get enough guys to support the, the, uh, the idea of letting them vote. Now, this is where it really gets interesting, right? Because sometimes in history, People do the right thing, but not necessarily for the right reason. Uh, and, and so this is where I'll come back. Uh, well, let me mention something about Brett. Brett is a member, diehard member of the Democratic Party. Uh, but at this time, this is after the Civil War, right? So the national government is being controlled by the Republicans. 
uh, for the most part. I mean, it, well, Lincoln is gone. There, there's a story there. I, uh, if you want to know, we'll, we can talk about it. But, yeah. but except for Lincoln, it's all Republicans, right? Uh, and now it's Johnson, but they're, they're anyway. Uh, and Dr. Fink will talk a lot about that. But uh, so that means, since Wyoming's a territory, all of the guys in charge of Wyoming are Republicans. But the territorial legislature, including Bright, is dominated by the Democrats. And so the Democrats decide, let's really stick it to the Republican governor. Guy, this guy, the governor's name is Campbell. So let's stick it to Governor Campbell by supporting women's suffrage. Because there's two ways then that can go. He can then say, okay, that's fine, and Wyoming will be the first state to let women vote. That's crazy, uh, right, people think, or at least that's what they're thinking. Or uh, he can veto it. And if he vetoes it, then this looks bad because the national Republicans are at least giving a lot of lip service to women's uh, votes, right? They're not really doing anything, but they're at least talking about, you know, women should get the right to vote and so on. So, uh, so either way, it's a win-win, right? Uh, or at least that's what they're thinking. Surprisingly, the governor doesn't veto it, so he lets it pass. And so women get the right to vote. Now, there's another side to this, and Bright always said that this was not, some people said, well, was this just kind of an elaborate joke that backfired horribly, sort of like my mantra tea joke? Uh, no, uh, he, he was sincere in that this was legit, and that he felt that women deserved the right to vote, uh, uh, especially in his favor, <coughs> white women, which gets to the next point. People can do the right thing for the wrong reason, right? Well, one of the things, reasons that Bright is motivated to let women vote is um, there are a lot of people moving into Wyoming, and lots of them are men. And a lot of these men are not white men. Uh, a lot of, believe it or not, there's African Americans moving to Wyoming, right? Uh, and now, under the, uh, the amendments that the radical Republicans are pushing through, right, 13's ending slavery, 14's uh, explaining what citizenship is, and then 15, of course, is votes for African Americans. That one's ratified in 1870. Uh, so, uh, that means those folks are going to be, those men will be enfranchised. Also, Bright, and this is pretty typical of Westerners, is pretty worried about the Chinese. That the Chinese may come in, and we're going to do a lot of things to keep the Chinese from voting, from being citizens. But because of the 14th Amendment, their children will be citizens. And so Bright is thinking, well, if we're going to let these other non-white men vote, shouldn't we let women vote? And in Wyoming, the majority of women are white women. There, there, are, there, there are almost no Chinese women. There's an interesting story there. We can talk about that if you want. Uh, and there's not very many African American women either. So this will augment the number of white voters, also at the same time sort of not disfranchising those other groups, but making them less politically powerful, right? So he supports women's suffrage, but for this uh, kind of, let's say, pretty racist reason, right? So again, he's doing the right thing, not necessarily for the right reasons. Uh, all right, so, uh, but anyway, so it does come to pass. They do uh, allow women to vote. Still a territory, but they'll keep that uh, as part of when Wyoming is brought in as a state, they keep that uh, with them, and so Wyoming is one of the first states to let women vote. They're the very first place, but they're a territory, so. All right, uh, let's see. What else can I tell you about that? I think that was it. <laughs> yes, ma'am. But you did Wyoming become a state. Um, it's a state in the 1870s, right? So it was under territory, women got the yeah. right to vote in a <coughs> territory for what, five or seven years? Uh, for what, like ten years or so, okay. yeah, so for quite a while. It was in the 1890s. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, so uh, it's kind of an interesting story, right? And we, we think of this sort of myth, uh, you know, we want historic historical actors to do good things just because they're the right things, but sometimes, you know, this past is a little bit tough. Can we do something I was going to say before you ask? Let's just all go, and then we can just go questions. Okay, we have time. time. We can all jump in, and we can yeah, ask whatever we want. Time. Dr. Fink okay. doesn't want to be left with three minutes. Well, the fact that the last one, some of the questions were ones we could all jump yes. in. Yes, yes. Okay, okay, so that means we are bringing up Dr. Fink then. No, Dr. Fink. That's what I said. He deferred. Um, excuse me. I appreciate uh, Dr. Pierce's segue in. I'm talking primarily about Colorado as a Colorado historian. And uh, 
Colorado's story overlaps with Wyoming's, with Texas's, with all of these, these places, as you've heard, essentially for, for unique local reasons. Colorado joins the Union as a state in 1876, our nickname, the Centennial State, from Centennial, 100 years after the U.S. becomes an independent country. And the year after statehood, there was a proposal for a, uh, a vote to amend the state constitution to grant full women's suffrage for women in the state. Part of that was women in Colorado <coughs> saying, if women in the territory of Wyoming, to the north of us, the three women who live in Wyoming, <laughs> have a right to vote, why on earth should not the women of Colorado as a state? And this campaign in 1877 draws a great deal of attention. In fact, Susan B. Anthony travels to Colorado several times during the campaign season leading up to November of 1877, and she gives speeches all over the state, the mountains, and uh, mining camps, farm towns on the eastern plains, and she has a great deal of support from the territorial government, the governor, the legislature, are all pretty supportive of this. But I have to emphasize, for all of our stories, this boils down to a question, women's suffrage in the late 1800s boils down to men deciding whether women should have the same votes, the same right to vote that they did. That's, that's really the question that men are being asked, should women have that same influence? And in 1877, when this goes up for a vote, even though it's had national attention and there have been big popular rallies with Susan B. Anthony and the rest, about three quarters of the male voters of Colorado in 1877 said no. And the primary reason goes back to something Dr. Fink had mentioned, the idea of, of separate spheres that men thought politics is a public part of the family, that's a man's job, a woman's job is not to be part of this public role. And so uh, the, the women's suffrage movement kind of stumbles, it retreats from the ballot box in Colorado for a number of years, but it stays active in women's social organizations, in, in uh, women's pioneer groups and social clubs and things like that. And those become uh, the, the, the communities of activists throughout the state which leads up to 1890, when Wyoming becomes a state, and part of Wyoming's state constitution carried on, along with any number of other policies, carried on the idea of equal suffrage for men and women. And once again, the attitude in Colorado is, all right, Wyoming's a state now, the first state, not just a territory, but a state, to have equal suffrage for men and women. And if the women of Wyoming can have it, why can't we? We are both giant invisible rectangles. We're just as big as they are. What, what makes Wyoming better than us? And so really it was the victory in Wyoming that gives the women's suffrage movement in Colorado enough of, of a push. And the legislature puts a question on the ballot in 1893, three years after Wyoming had joined the union, asking the male voters of Wyoming, again, essentially the same thing they rejected in 1877, the same question comes up in 1893, should women have the same political power and rights that men do? Now, one of the strongest supporters, and this had continued, that there was a lot of, of support in Colorado politically for women's suffrage, drawing along with what Dr. Pearson mentioned of, of racial lines, you know, why, why should a black man have the right to vote if a white woman doesn't? That sort of argument was just as powerful in Colorado as it was in any other territory. And the governor of Colorado at that time, 1893, was the only, uh, only non-Democrat or Republican who'd ever been governor of Colorado, a populist named Davis Waite. And Governor Waite was a big fan of women voting for the same reason. I, I think that it would, he would say, I would think it would boost the, the numbers of people I want to turn out at the polling place. And Colorado's male electorate approved women's suffrage in 1893 by a measure of two to one. So a big shift from what the attitude had been only 16 years earlier when you have you know, two thirds of the male voters of Colorado saying, yes, women deserve the same political rights. The first election in which women could vote in Colorado was in 1894, the next one that came up. And in that election, women, uh, in, in far greater numbers than men, 
voted against Governor Waite because, yeah, he might have supported women's suffrage, but he was, he was unpopular for any number of reasons. And Governor Waite, for the rest of his days after he'd been kicked out of office, railed about the fact that he had made such a terrible decision in encouraging women to have the right to vote because he had they robbed him of the governorship. He was a moron. He robbed himself. <laughs> but that's okay. That 1894 election was important not only because it was the first election for Colorado's uh, women, and I should, before I get to that, I should emphasize, when Colorado's male voters approved women's suffrage in 1893, that was the first time anywhere in the country that men had voted as in a state, men had voted specifically on the question of women's suffrage, not on, say, should we adopt the Constitution of Wyoming that has women's suffrage, but just on that issue. And so Colorado likes to, to puff its chest a little bit and say, you know, we were the first place where men in a state were asked that question alone, unencumbered by anything else, and said yes. The 1894 election, the first one that women had the right to vote in in Colorado, saw the election of three women to our State House of Representatives. They were the first three women elected to a legislative body, certainly in the United States, if not beyond. And from that point on, Colorado has been at the forefront of women serving especially in the legislature. We've always had one of the highest rates of women uh, participants in the legislature in the country, culminating in the current session. Uh, the legislature that was elected in 2018 has a majority women legislature, both uh, Republicans, Democrats together. There are more women than men in the Colorado legislature. There's just as much bickering goes on in the legislature <laughs> today. So, um, but but it is certainly one of those those milestones that Colorado's really glad to, to snag hold of yet another one. So, now that I've celebrated my home and native state, I'll turn things over to our final speaker, Dr. Fink. <clears throat> All right. Well. I'm going to actually do a little of two. I thought I'd maybe throw something about Oklahoma in there, but I, I thought before I mentioned something about Utah, just because we've had an uh, answer a question that hasn't even been asked. I think there's also another issue when you're dealing with women's voting. You have to remember that in this early time, especially, we're still not dealing with a secret ballot. <coughs> and so we don't go to a secret ballot until the 1880s, 1890s. And so one of the reasons also that stopping women to vote was the idea that women would just be forced to vote the way their husbands would make them vote, which is a legitimate concern in the 1880s, 1890s, because women had no property rights, no freedoms, no anything. And so there was that, that potential of, of, of basically taking that right away from women, even if you give it to them. So something to kind of remember, I don't think we think about that, but we don't go to a secret ballot till the very end of, of that century. So. Utah is very different, um, probably still very different, um, because this whole question revolves around religion, um, and particularly polygamy. Uh, at this point, the Mormon Church still dominates Utah, as still pretty much does today in, in a way. Um, but at this time, Mormon men were practicing polygamy. And so the question, when it really came down to uh, talking about women voting, you actually had both sides of the state of Utah fighting for women to, to have the vote. The non-Mormon element that is moving in, in a rather large pace by the 1860s and 70s, still a minority, but growing, believed that if they could only give women the right to vote, that Mormon women would overwhelmingly reject polygamy and reject the church. Um, at the same time, the church itself is very much pushing for the right to vote for women as well, with the idea that Mormon women would overwhelmingly support the church and support polygamy. So it really was all about this, this institution of polygamy, both sides thinking right, that women are going to be either against it or women are going to be for it. So actually in 1870, it's still a territory as well. Um, Utah's going to pass a, because both sides are going to support it, and they're going to pass a, a measure to allow women the, the right to vote. Um, and my understanding, and you correct me, is that actually Utah's the first state to actually vote. I was, when I was yeah. looking up on this, Colorado passes at first, Utah had an election earlier. Um, so they, <laughs> so the first actual votes cast were would be in Utah, and this was a big deal. Um, again, the same women, you know, Susan B. Anthony, um, they come out to Utah. They actually talk in the Tabernacle in, on Temple Square, which is sort of where the Mormon Church conducted all their business. And so the church welcomed them in, pushed this idea of women having the right to vote, and they did for some time. Um, the problem is going to be again politics gets involved. 
And in 1887, the United States government is going to pass the Edmund Tucker Act, which is going to outlaw polygamy. And when they pass the Tucker Act, they also are going to take away women's right to vote in the state of Utah. Because it's still, it's still a territory, so they have the ability to do that. The idea was if we are going to weed out polygamy, because what happened is was Utah women supported polygamy. And so if you want to get rid of polygamy, you have to take away the women's right to vote, which is going to, it's almost the opposite of what is going on in Colorado and with their right. We want to actually get rid of the women's right to vote to help the people that are moving into the state have more and more, more power, which is the non-Mormon vote. So the federal government actually comes in and strips away that right to vote because the Mormon vote was simply too strong and they weren't able to accomplish anything. <laughs> this clearly makes women upset. And what will happen is, again, this is interesting, is you get the Mormon women and the non-Mormon women will come together and will organize themselves into suffragist clubs. Um, because, so they are very unhappy, clearly, that they lost the right to vote. And so even though they have different reasons, they're going to unite and they're going to be you know, a very powerful lobby because they, they're used to exercising their rights you know, to, to participate in government. So they're going to fight it and fight it for some time. Um, finally, again, in 1895, when Utah was going up for statehood themselves, there was a large enough group of women to get both sides supporting this. So there really wasn't any opposition um, that they were able to put it into the Constitution when they submitted their Constitution for statehood. Women, again, were, were re-granted the right to vote where they had already lost it. Um, so that's just an interesting. So again, there's very much religion. Um, I'll just throw something out about Oklahoma because it's, what's interesting about Oklahoma where I live now is I was surprised to see that there wasn't a bigger push. Um, Dr. Everett mentioned the governor was a populist in, in Colorado. The populists were pro-women's right to vote. And one of the largest populist states in the country when it came to, you know, elected was Oklahoma. It was a major populist movement in a major state. So when we were doing this panel, I thought, I'll look up Oklahoma a little bit too. And I found very little push for Oklahomans fighting for women's right to vote. I thought there would be. I thought the populist influence of our state, which was again huge in Oklahoma. Um, so what I was what I able to find in, about in Oklahoma was there was several times, 1897, 1899, there were pushes to get the right to vote for women, but very strongly on that separate, separate sphere ideology. What they were arguing was we need the right to vote, mainly to vote on school board issues. Um, and they wanted to be able to have, because again, their idea is we need to do our job as women. So they were pushing this idea that we can't do our job if we don't have some say in this. So it was mostly on that, and obviously with alcohol, we talked about that. They tend to go hand in hand oftentimes, um, but the idea again, we need the right to vote so that we can outlaw alcohol. It was often what most women were, were fighting for during this time. So there was a push. Um, Oklahoma is very late to statehood, obviously, but in, in 1906, um, there was a really strong push our version of the governor that you all groaned about in Oklahoma was a guy named Bill, Al Bill Al Al Alfalfa, right? And Bill Al so Bill is Murray. Bill, Bill Alfalfa Murray, he was our version, and he was very much against the women's rights. So he was able to block it at every turn. Um, they finally do, in 1918, though, they're able to pass a constitutional amendment that they're going to give women the right to vote in Oklahoma, but again, only for certain issues. So it wasn't across the board, which is interesting. Again, it was school board issues. Um, mostly really school board issues was the main vote. They weren't allowed to vote on national politics until eventually, obviously, the, 20th, the 19th Amendment is passed and um, Oklahoma does ratify it, and Utah ratified it as well, I think, so. Um, that's good enough, so. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, We've got, um, we've got some time. Let's open it up for some. I know I've got questions. Questions for Cheryl or one for Bearded Gentleman? A panel on women by three old beard guys. <laughs> <laughs> I told Cheryl before we started, I said at least there's one woman on the panel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we all support Texas women. women. I happen to be the most casually dressed. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Thank you were talking about Utah, Wyoming. I'm from Idaho, and so I went to school in Idaho. And I, I, you know, what do you think? Just kind of from your gut, what is it about the West that makes it a good, you know, sort of place to promote these ideas that are so progressive? What, what at the time in particular? And anyone can answer that, please. I think, from from my perspective, it's the institutions, the political structure, the governmental structure is so new. Things haven't had a chance to set yet. And, and that's kind of reflected in the fact that when Wyoming and Utah and Colorado and Idaho and others 
have, have approved women's suffrage at the end of the 19th century, this becomes fodder for women in New York, for women in Virginia who are saying, what on earth makes women in Colorado worth having the right to vote? And we here on Fifth Avenue in New York City don't. But, but I think it's that there, there was at least just a little bit less of the entrenched ideology that you had to fight in such a brand new place. Do you think it's also because women had to take on new roles being in the West and had to sort of be, assert themselves more? Not this year. Yeah, I think uh, that's there's some truth to that as well. Uh, one of the first postmasters, which is an important job back in the day, running your post office in Wyoming, is a woman. She was she's one of the early postmen. In fact, in South Pass, uh, and so women, you know, there are women ranchers and there are women doing things that they wouldn't do necessarily in the more settled east. And, and so there is there is some of that. I uh, definitely kind of a belief that well, women have proven themselves out west. Uh, maybe you know we should do something to you know kind of reward them. And at least with the case of Wyoming, there was uh, one of the reasons the legislature pushes it is at the time there were uh, six men for every woman in Wyoming, and they thought, hey, maybe if we give them the one vote, some of them will want to move out here. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, 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 yeah, they're still hoping for that. <laughs> I think if we talk about the West even still today, like if, if we, you know, Cosby sometimes like, what defines the West? The times it's so much geographic and some of it's like an attitude. And yeah. I think we still think of the West as a little bit more free, free right? Really? A little bit more, yeah, I mean, a little bit more independent spirit. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that goes all the way back to the beginning. We're looking at very wide open places. Um, I grew up in Virginia, and you just feel kind of enclosed, right? Yeah. The trees, the forest, and then you come out to the, and you, you can't see the end. I mean, and so there's something about the West. Again, I, I think with them, it's, it's new, it's free, but there's just there is there is an attitude of that entrepreneur, that independent spirit that's moving out to the West that are more willing to you know kind of live, let live, give freedom to anybody. And I think that's one of the reasons we're able to kind of work their way in there because it's not as re restrictive, and people are just much more open about new, yeah. new ideas. Yeah, you could spot for that. What else? Oh, please. You kind of addressed this a moment ago, but I was curious, like, what role it played on the national stage for the national vote for women? I mean, like, you kind of addressed it, but it's still 50 years about from Wyoming till the national one. So, so like, how was it used on the national stage? Well, just in you know a few years before the 19th Amendment gets passed, we were fighting World War One, you know, and so women were stepping in to fill that role, you know, because men are going off to war, you know, they're filling you know the jobs and the factories and everywhere else, and they're also going you know over to Europe, you know, as nurses joining like Red Cross to help in that. So women stepping up and their vital efforts during the war that is a big push among public opinion for why you know. They should get the right to vote. They deserve it. You know, they did all this for us. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. People like Carrie Chapman Cat were, were, were negotiating with, with, with Wilson during this time. I mean, again, you kind of have this two dual system, and, and Al, Alice Paul is, is, is protesting the war and protesting the Wilson, but in Cat is much more the major group, and she's working with Wilson and saying, hey, we'll do this all, but when we're done, we do expect this. I mean, so she wasn't just lying down. We I mean, to adamant about the vote. I, I, I think World War One is the number one thing that really changes people's perspective. Because women will do all the work during the war, and then they demand when they're done. And we, you'll see that on wars all throughout the Civil War. You get a big movement. You know, it comes out of really the 30s and 40s. But then you kind of see wars always kind of spur women into because they're doing things in their way. The World War One really jumps ahead. On that. Okay, let's go back to Sarah. Yeah, what I didn't hear you talk about was much about the discourse of motherhood and children. Um, and Jared, there's some interesting Western women writers that link um, Eliopedia, so I'm thinking about linking uh, suffrage in the West with national movements, but a lot of that was framed around um, protecting children and creating a national children, you know, children's bureau. But I think also in World War I, that goes to you're sending our sons to die at war, and we don't have a say in that. So sometimes it's also, I think, the way motherhood is deployed in those conversations. And, and the early Western states, it, it's kind of develops organically. The, they're not really, you know, Wyoming's not really in contact with now's or any of the national organizations. And so what happens is, as those Western states start to give women the right to vote, then Eastern kind of women's rights establishments are to recognize that, like in Texas, right? They come out and, and start kind of working with them. And I, I think it's at that point that they realize that a state-by-state -state strategy is a pretty good way to go. Right? That 
ultimately, you know, you're not going to get all women right to vote until there's a constitutional amendment. But if you get states to start, you know, one by one by one, mm -hmm. especially in the West, start giving women the right to vote, then that kind of snowballs and helps them on a kind of a national stage as well. So. It's what Colorado's been doing with marijuana for the past few years. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. when, when, when we think about when we think about western states and territories west of the Mississippi in, in the early days of, of women's suffrage, we know that there is a gender disparity between males and females in these territories and states at that time. If the if the persona is true that most of the most of the school teachers were females, do we have any data that suggests that that some of the push to drive for for the right for women to vote in these western territories, western states was simply based on the idea that the women that were there had the ability to read and the men that were there did not. So education levels. I mean, it makes sense, but I have no idea, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that hasn't really been That's a great book there, if anyone <laughs> 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 There you go. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> So I will say thank you.